Hey everybody, welcome to week two of A Field Guide to Particle Physics. This week we are talking about cosmic genetic muons, that is, particles coming at us from outer space. After this week's video, you'll be able to answer questions like, what are cosmic rays? And what are their relationship to muons? What exactly is a muon? Where can I go to find a muon? And how does a muon's speed affect its decay? And finally, can muons really travel faster than the speed of light? As always, references are included in the description below, and if you're officially registered for the course, you got yours Sunday night with the lecture notes. Great, so let's get started. On the trail, in your car, at your desk, hundreds of particles are zipping by you all the time. They're raining down on us, and most of them just zip right through us. Sometimes we get hit, but you can't really feel it. They're just too small. Unlike the alpha particles we discussed last week, these little beasts are extremely fast. They fly straight through our skin, straight through glass, bricks, hundreds of feet of rock. Indeed, scientists have set up labs deep in underground caves just to keep them from messing up their experiments. But just what are these particles that are raining down on us from the sky? And how did they get there in the first place? Just what is going on in the upper atmosphere? Last week we discussed the solar wind. You see, the sun emits not just light, but also a ton of charged particles at pretty high speeds. These particles could be really hazardous to us, if not for the fact that the Earth has a magnetic field that captures those particles as they blow in. But not all particles impinging upon the Earth get caught up in the Earth's magnetic field. Some make it through, and those that do typically have really high energies. These are the particles coming at us from all directions. These are the particles coming in from deep space, and they're coming in hot. That is to say, they're coming in with really high speeds. Historically, these ultra-high-speed particles have been called cosmic rays. So what, what is a cosmic ray? What's in these cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are a good reminder that space is kind of a mess. There's all kinds of things zipping around. Cosmic rays themselves are kind of a diverse lot. They're comprised of mostly atomic nuclei, but also some electrons. 90% of those particles are basically protons, but you know, about 9% or so are comprised of alpha particles, which we discussed last time. We see some other stuff too, some heavier stuff like oxygen. You can even find high energy iron nuclei coming in from outer space. Those electrons we mentioned, they comprise about 1% of the sum total of cosmic rays. What caused these particles to be fired at us? <laughs> well, particles moving that fast need to be accelerated somehow. And space is full of all kinds of monsters that can do that for us. Often, that kind of acceleration requires a magnetic field, similar to the magnetic field that we have around the Earth, only much stronger and much larger. So far as we can tell, a large chunk of the cosmic rays come from remnants of supernovae. A what? <laughs> Big stars, stars that are a bit bigger than our own sun, tend to end their lives in cataclysmic explosions. For a brief moment, these kind of run-of-the-mill, statistically average stars become the brightest objects, or at least some of the brightest objects, in the known universe. The result of these explosions is an expanding cloud of hot gas and space dust full of junk. Some of that junk actually coalesces back to form planets and solar systems like ours. But a lot of it just hangs out in space, growing and growing and growing. Astrophysical models tell us that these expanding supernovae remnants, these gas clouds, uh, are a great place to find giant magnetic fields and lots of charged particles bouncing around within them. These magnetic fields have a bunch of particles moving at all different kinds of speeds, but every once in a while, one of the particles inside gets just a little kick too hard and gets blasted out uh, from, from that magnetic trap and shot out into deep space. Those particles that escape from those supernovae remnants are what we would consider cosmic rays. 
Now, these cosmic rays in particular are kind of statistical flukes. You see, inside that supernovae remnant, there's particles with all kinds of velocities. Some that are going a little slow, some that are going a little fast, and some that are kind of about average. Now, around the average, of course, you're gonna have some outliers, some that are going really fast, and some that are going really, really fast. Those giant supernovae remnants can only hold particles with just enough energy. Eventually, some of them will get kicked out. Those particles that already have super duper high velocities that accidentally get kicked just a little bit higher in collisions, those are the ones that escape the magnetic trap, and those are the ones that we get to observe on Earth. In a sense, those particles that get booted out of the magnetic trap of the supernovae remnant kind of boil out. And the boiling point, if you like, is set by the size and shape and scale of that gas cloud. But the important point to take home is we only get to see the fastest, the highest energy particles that manage to escape that glass cloud because the rest of them are still trapped inside. So we're biased towards seeing the really high energy particles. And so that's why the particles that we see on Earth are traveling so fast. But you see, here's the thing. The astrophysicists have done the calculations. These supernovae remnant accelerators are big and they're massive, but they're not big enough to account for all of the cosmic rays that we see at the really high end of the energy spectrum. There has to be other sources. As for other sources, there's plenty of options. A notable one is a neutron star. You see, after a star goes supernovae, sometimes, if the mass is right, it will collapse down to what is called a neutron star, uh, another kind of remnant, a solid remnant, if you like, of the explosion. Now, a neutron star is gonna have a lot of mass, like 10, 20 times the mass of our sun, but it's gonna be compressed into something the size of the Earth. So you can think of it as a planet-sized atomic nucleus. They're almost entirely made up of neutrons. That's really, really dense. Something that dense is definitely an extreme form of matter. The story of neutron stars is long and deep and involves nuclear physics and astrophysics and is super interesting, but for our purposes here, suffice it to say they're really extreme objects. And those extreme objects spin, and they spin terrifyingly fast. The days of a neutron star are measured in seconds. The associated magnetic dynamo associated to something that massive spinning that fast is far greater than the magnetic field generated here on Earth. Basically, you can generate arbitrarily high particle velocities by accelerating them through a magnetic field generated by a spinning neutron star. Another good candidate for a cosmic accelerator is an active galactic nucleus, which is something that astrophysicists call when they really mean a supermassive black hole. These things tend to show up in the middle of galaxies. They're really, really, so far as we can tell anyway, really big, and sometimes they can be extremely active. As matter pours into these black holes event horizons, they tend to radi all kinds of junk tends to radiate out. Now, we don't really have a full understanding of the science behind them, which is why we call them active galactic nuclei, but suffice it to say, they too can generate massive magnetic fields that can definitely be responsible for the crazy high energy end of the cosmic ray spectrum. Long story short, the universe is full of terrifying, humongous beasts that generate massive magnetic fields that are totally more than capable of spinning up particles to extremely high velocities. These are the cosmic rays. Okay, so, so what? These extremely high energy particles that are coming at us from all directions collide with molecules in the upper atmosphere, and they are traveling so fast that those collisions tend to create massive showers of all kinds of shrapnel and other particles. As we alluded to last week, protons and other nuclei are kind of like messy bags of all sorts of other subatomic partons or particles. So when a big messy bag of stuff smashes at really high energy into something else, a whole bunch of junk comes spewing out. Pions are one kind of particle that are a common part of that shrapnel. Pions are just like protons, only a bit smaller, about one-sixth the size, and they too are messy bags of all kinds of other nuclear junk. These pions are unstable, and so they'll rapidly decay into other things, and the dominant decay product of a pion is a muon. In summary, 
mind-bogglingly fast particles are flying at us from space, and those particles are mostly nuclei. Those nuclei smash into molecules in the upper atmosphere, and a whole bunch of junk settles out. But the thing that we can observe, the only thing that really makes it to the surface of the Earth, are the muons. And we see a lot of those muons. Experiments suggest that on the surface of the Earth, about one square centimeter of space sees about one muon per minute. So to think about that in human terms, look at your keyboard. Each key on the keyboard is about a square centimeter. And you know, if you account for the space bar and things like that, there's about 60 keys in your keyboard. So one particle flies through your keyboard every second, which means that more than one particle is flying through you every second. Crazy, right? So yeah, these things are everywhere. And because of their ancestry, being born from particles coming at us from deep space, we call these muons cosmogenic muons. <laughs> but wait, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here. What exactly is a muon? At a rough glance, muons have all the same properties as electrons, except for they're about 200 times heavier. They have the same electric charge, they interact in basically the same way. So far as we can tell, they're both point-like particles. Like electrons, muons have antimatter particles, or anti-muons, that are exactly equal partners, except for they have the opposite electric charge. And these properties have been put to the test by physicists. You can create a hydrogen atom with a proton and a muon, although the orbit of the muon is much smaller than the electron's orbit, just because of the way that the mass difference works out. And hopefully you're all still fans of helium-4, so here's a fun fact for you. If you take a helium-4 atom and replace one of the electrons with a muon, you get something that looks a lot like hydrogen. Let me explain. The muon's orbit is so small, it's basically sitting right on top of the nucleus. So from a chemical perspective, it looks actually like a hydrogen atom with only one free electron. In this case, the muon acts as a kind of charged shield to kind of hide or obfuscate one of those protons in the helium nucleus. This looks so much like hydrogen that physicists have come to name it hydrogen 4.1. Despite that really weird example, muons and electrons are really similar, and given how important electrons are to our modern day technology, you would know a lot more about them if it weren't for one small quirk of the muon. You see, they are not stable particles. Muons decay. But muons aren't like nuclei. They're not big bags full of different particles that are breaking apart in any sense. So you might ask, just what do you mean that a muon decays? Well, that's a good point. So to address that issue, let's talk about particle decays more broadly. Last week, we studied the alpha decay of large nuclei. We said that those decays happened because it lowered the energy of all the particles involved, and we talked about it from a perspective of quantum mechanics. But now let's look at it from the perspective of masses. The mass of a uranium-238 nucleus, as it turns out, is greater than the mass of both the helium-4 nucleus that emits as an alpha particle and the thorium-234 nucleus that's left behind. The rest of the energy is kind of emitted into particle motion. But what's important here is that the two particles that we're left with after the alpha decay have less mass than the original nucleus. But of course, particle physics is way more fun and nuanced than just things breaking apart and being put back together again. As it turns out, particles can actually transform, they, they can morph into a completely different species. Now, there are complicated rules for this depending upon what particles are involved and what forces are involved and what the kind of situation is, but generically speaking, heavy particles decay into lighter particles, and they always do so in such a way that the total electric charge is left the same. So let's consider the pion. The pion is part of that mess that happens in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays come in from space and smash into a molecule. It's part of that junk. It's very similar to the proton in the sense that it's a bag full of particles and it's a big kind of nuclear mess, um, but it's about one-sixth the size. We see them in collider experiments too. And what's important here is that pions are unstable and they also decay. Pions decay into muons. 
You see, the mass of a pion is about 140 in some crazy units. And as it turns out, in those units, the mass of a muon is 105. So it's probably not surprising to learn that a pion is going to decay into a muon. And, and some other junk. And this, of course, brings us back to the muon. You know, those things that are kind of passing through us all the time from all over the place, coming in from the sky that we can't really see, but we kind of know are there. Muons decay too. Funny thing is, there's not a lot of particles that are lighter than the muon. So what's the muon going to decay into? Well, I guess it's a question of what's left. And if we think about it, it's just the electron. So, yep, muons decay into electrons. And they decay pretty quickly, 2.2 microseconds on average, which is, you know, 2.2 millionths of a second. So if you haven't heard of a muon before, I totally can't blame you. They don't hang around for very long. Incidentally, muons, when they decay, also spit out something called a neutrino. Neutrinos may be ubiquitous, but they don't have an electric charge, and their mass is really, really tiny, and they don't interact very well, so they kind of just flow through everything. They're almost like ghosts. And so for our purposes today, I'm just going to kind of gloss over them. I'll draw them in the diagrams and so on, but, but really we'll wait until next week to really discuss how the universe is haunted by these little tiny particles. But yeah, so that completes our story about the cosmic rays. The cosmic rays come in from space, smash into molecules in the upper atmosphere. Those eventually turn into muons, which shower down upon Earth. And eventually, after 2.2 microseconds, they turn into electrons and everything's back to normal. Sort of. Now that we talk about it, does it bother you at all that a muon decays after only 2.2 microseconds? I mean, sure, it's sad to see them go, but... There's a big problem with their short lifetime. You see, cosmogenic muons, those muons formed in the upper atmosphere, are formed about 30 miles above the ground, 50 kilometers. Here's a question for you. How fast can light travel in 2.2 microseconds? The answer? Less than half a mile, about 660 meters. That's it. That's not that far, and that certainly isn't the distance from the upper atmosphere to the surface of the Earth. So even if these muons are traveling close to the speed of light, which they are, they should decay long before they hit the Earth. So what gives? As with all things in the universe, perspective matters. Muons only live 2.2 microseconds on average, from their perspective. As it turns out, from our perspective, they can live like 10 times as long, no problem. <laughs> Which, okay, what gives? This is where things start to get a little weird. The difference in perspective is afforded by Einstein's special theory of relativity. This is what relates space and time into four-dimensional space-time. The number one takeaway from Einstein's theory of special relativity is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. So one question is, how do you enforce a speed limit like that? How do you make it a physical requirement? If you've got a particle that's going very close to the speed of light, can't you always just kick it a little bit harder to make it go just a little bit faster? You know, give it just slightly more energy? In other words, why are there absolutely no exceptions, and what happens if you keep giving a particle more and more energy? And of course, the answer turns out to be a requirement in mathematics, which is why it's always true. The more energy a particle accumulates, the faster it goes. That's still true. But as it turns out, while the energy will scale pretty much indefinitely, the increase in velocity starts to get slower and slower and slower as it approaches closer and closer to the speed of light. So how exactly does this happen in practice? Perspective, hence the name relativity. It took me a little while to realize that I'm not going to do this justice in five minutes or 10 minutes. So I'll put out a separate explainer video on all of these ideas, but 
For our purposes here, it's at least worth pointing out that the thing about special relativity is that time and space, while they do get kind of merged together, the idea is that when you move faster, some of what you think is time gets transformed into what someone else thinks is space and vice versa. It's very hard to digest even for professionals. It's even more difficult to explain. So there are two main ideas from special relativity worth talking about. First is that the speed of light is the maximum speed for all things in the universe, period. And that's just a mathematical fact. And kind of the second major implication is that depending on what speed you're going, and I guess what direction, you will see events happen in a different order, uh, potentially, than other folks. And that kind of lack of simultaneity is um, what makes it so counterintuitive. All right, back to the show. And this weird looking transformation that effectively fixes the speed of light as the cosmic speed limit turns out to be a feature of the four dimensional world that we live in, space time. Thus, the muons flying in from the upper atmosphere that are traveling at like 99.5% of the speed of light that only live for 2.2 microseconds looks to us on Earth like they live something like 22 microseconds which is more than enough time for them to get all the way down to the surface of the Earth. Weird, right? But hey, that's the world that we live in. Those are the laws of physics. That is special relativity. There's one more fun topic worth mentioning before we go, and that is Cherenkov radiation. When we talked about the speed of light being fixed, being a universal speed limit, we qualified that by saying the speed of light in a vacuum, you know, like in the vacuum of space. And what we mean by that is, well, light can travel at different speeds depending upon what medium it's in. In other words, light tends to slow down when it's traveling through things like glass, like water, like air. Famously, light travels at different speeds when the air is different temperatures which gives rise to a mirage or an illusion of water on the roadway when the temperatures are just right. This kind of change in the speed of light effect is really noticeable in water, where its speed can be reduced by something like 25%. If you've ever placed a straw in a glass of water or looked at somebody who is sitting in a pool, you've seen this effect in action. Now, special relativity doesn't really care about what medium the light is going through. Light interacts with the little particles in the glass, the little particles in the ice, the little particles in the water, and that's why it slows down. But the speed of light is a universal constant for everything. So when we say that the light slows down in water or ice, we talk about an effective speed of light. Electromagnetically charged particles talk to each other by light, by emission and absorption of light particles, photons. So it makes sense that a charged particle flowing through something where the speed of light has been reduced kind of messes with the physics a little bit. That really gets us to the question is, what happens when the speed of light is reduced by 25%, but you've got these muons careening in from space at 99.5% of the speed of light? What happens there? A similar analogy might be a fighter jet flying through the air, traveling faster than the speed of sound, faster than the sound that it's creating itself. What happens is it creates these shock waves in the sound, which you know to us sounds like a big sonic boom. For the case of water or ice, with a charged particle smashing through it at such a high speed, something similar happens, only it's a shock wave of light. Like the sonic boom, the shock wave in the ice or the water is biased towards the higher frequency light waves. So for you know the case of ice, we see ultraviolet radiation being the dominant contribution. This UV dominated light is what we call Cherenkov radiation. As we discussed in our introductory video, Cherenkov radiation has been shown to be responsible for changing the composition of ancient gases trapped in little bubbles deep in the Greenland ice sheet, as well as giving rise to that eerie blue glow inside of uh, nuclear reactor cooling ponds. Recently, 
Cherenkov radiation has been used as a tool in the Antarctic ice sheet to create a massive telescope to look for particles coming from outer space. These particles are related to neutrinos, which we talked about earlier, so we will have much to say about them next week. We'll be right back.